Last week, Pastor Ryan preached an amazing message about the crucifixion of Jesus, and we heard the horrible reality of how our Savior was mocked and tortured, and ultimately we came to realize that Jesus bore the curse of death on the cross so that we can walk in the promise of life. This week, our lesson is a continuation of that same theme as we encounter the fateful moment when Jesus finally breathes his last breath and gives himself over to death. Our goal for today is to examine what exactly happened when our God laid down his life for us. I'm a bit nervous that by looking at the practical theology of this moment that we might somehow lose sight of the horrific beauty of it. Our big idea could be that Jesus' sacrifice of himself was the single greatest act of selfless love that will ever be. I suspect that God himself orchestrated the mood for the events of Christ's work on the cross. And I think it helps us to see the whole picture. Because indeed, this was the darkest moment in history. It's interesting to note that all of the key events leading up to Christ's death happened in the dark. The Passover meal, the prayer in Gethsemane, the betrayal of Judas, uh, the betrayal by Judas, uh, Christ's arrest and Peter's denial, the trial before the Sanhedrin and before Pontius Pilate. All of this happened at night. Now it was morning when he carried his cross and was lifted up onto the cross. That happened at about 9 o'clock a.m. But then we see Mark 15, 33. When the sixth hour had come, that's right about noon, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Now, historians of the day, they wrote it off as a great eclipse. But, of course, we know that that's not what happened Eclipses don't last for hours. And also, we know that Passover occurs on the first night of the full moon that comes after the spring equinox. And you might remember from elementary school that a full moon occurs when the moon is all the way on the other side of the earth from the sun. And a lunar eclipse would be impossible. No, this darkness was a supernatural event. It was as if God himself placed his hand between us and the light. But why all this darkness? Why did God make everything so moody and dramatic? I think we find the answer throughout Scripture. You see, darkness in the Bible, it's very often associated with God's displeasure and judgment. Maybe the most obvious example comes from Exodus, the ninth plague that God sent against Pharaoh and Egypt was three whole days of darkness. But here's just a few more examples that we find in the prophets. The prophet Isaiah chapter 13, behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. The prophet Joel, the sun shall be turned to darkness And the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. The prophet Amos. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? And the prophet 
Zephaniah. The great day of the Lord is near, and hastening fast, the sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Darkness was the appropriate setting for this grand moment. And for three hours, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus. He, a perfect sinless man, received on his shoulder the full judgment that we, wretched sinners, deserve. This was the most important moment in human history, a moment that the prophet Isaiah had foretold nearly 700 years beforehand. In Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was pierced. For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In this dark moment, Jesus became a curse for us. Galatians 3, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Jesus Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. And Jesus became as dark and black as our very sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The perfect, spotless lamb was sacrificed for those who could not stand on their own before the judgment seat of God. And just to be clear, that's you and me. Our sin separates us from God. We deserve death and punishment. But because of his great love for us, he sent his only son to live a perfect life on our behalf, to pay the price for our sins in our place. And those who believe in him and follow him are saved. It is a beautiful and yet terrible sacrifice. It's amazing grace. But this was a dark moment, and God drove the point home by making it dark as night. And God made it pretty obvious that something important was going on. Talk about signs and wonders. It's amazing that anyone involved did not believe. The moment that Jesus died for our sins, there was a great earthquake. Buildings collapsed. Rocks were split in two. Tombs were opened, and people who had believed in Jesus came back to life and walked out and presented themselves in Jerusalem. What more could God have done to make it plain just how momentous this moment truly was? Perhaps the first person to come to faith after the cross was the centurion. He had been assigned you see, to preside over the death of Jesus. It was his job to ensure that no one rescued Jesus and that no one absconded with his body. And he brought 600 men, perhaps fearing that the crowds who attended Jesus' teaching would revolt. We don't know if he participated in, with his men when they put that crown of thorns on his head and mocked him 
We don't know if he cast lots for Jesus' garments with his soldiers. But we know he was a witness to everything that happened on that dark day. No doubt he carried on his person coins that declared that Caesar was the son of the divine Augustus, the son of God. And he was a hard man, a man well acquainted with death, a man who no doubt had caused much death as he worked his way up the ranks by being battle-hardened and brutal. I wonder if, when he put on his uniform that morning, he had any idea what he was about to experience. He had watched as Jesus interacted with the robbers. He had watched as Jesus tenderly arranged for his mother to be cared for by John. He had seen the many women who had courageously gathered around Jesus when all the men, save for John, had scattered. And he had watched carefully when the darkness descended and Jesus began to bear the weight of the sins of the world as a holy God poured out his wrath upon him. You see, the centurion knew about crucifixion. This was perhaps the most horrific way that man has ever devised for putting someone to death. There was no consideration about cruel and unusual punishment. In fact, it seemed as if the Romans were trying to perfect it. And yet he watched. And he must have seen that this was something else. It was something more. Maybe he didn't understand what was really happening at first, that the very Son of God was the one enduring it. He was Almighty God, and yet he did not strike down his enemies and free himself. He had a host of angels at his command. That same, that same army who had once slain 185,000 Assyrian soldiers in one night and yet he did not summon them. He did not even drink the anesthetic, the anesthetic wine that they had offered up to him to numb his senses. Jesus did not diminish his pain or suffering one iota for himself. And if you're like me, you don't even want to think about it. It's too horrible. But we need to think about it. Because like that centurion who had to watch that horror unfold through that flickering torchlight, we will see that this was the greatest act of God's love, of God's power, of God's goodness, of God's justice in all of human history. This was the moment when God proved once and for all that he is loving and faithful. And the centurion did not miss it. And the grace and mercy of his Savior pierced through the spiritual darkness within him and plunged deep into his very heart. And he came away believing. He saw that he had crucified an innocent man, and not only a man, but the very Son of God. Yet it's good news. Because here is the lesson. Those who believe in Jesus, like the centurion, like you and me, we are called to follow him. We are called to take up our cross. And in our unity with Jesus, we share not only in his victory over death, but also in his suffering that accomplished it. But we do not have to suffer in the dark because we are light. In the Lord. See, when we suffer in this broken world, if, if we allow ourselves to remain in the darkness, then we will not see any reason in it. It will seem senseless. Think of those ten disciples who had scattered. Jesus' suffering seemed senseless to them. It seemed hopeless. Surely God had abandoned them. They were in the dark and unable to see what was right in front of them, though they had heard it from Jesus himself. 
And when we remain in that darkness, this is how our own suffering appears. Like God is not in it. It seems unloving. How could a loving God allow this to happen? And the world of darkness around us is ready to offer up empty words. They will tell us that God cannot exist because suffering exists. They'll tell us that if God does exist, he doesn't care about our suffering. They will tell us that our suffering is senseless and it has nothing to do with God. But the Apostle Paul, and remember, God struck him blind for three days to get his attention. He reminds us to live in the light. In Ephesians 5, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time, you were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. You see, when we remember the cross, we realize that Jesus endured the darkest day so that we can walk in the light. And we're reminded that God has already proven himself. We know that our pain is not senseless. It is a part of God's plan for us. We know that we have not been abandoned, but that Jesus is with us until the end of this age. We know that we are loved because our Savior knows what it means to suffer, and he proved his love for us by enduring a suffering that is greater than anything we will ever know. Even a Gentile like the centurion, could see that Jesus was obviously the Son of God. But for the Jews, it was even more evident, or it should have been, because of all the prophecies that were fulfilled that day. And so let's take a moment now and look at some of them. Evidence that Jesus was the Messiah. The first one, it seems kind of small, but he was given sour wine. See, King David wrote Psalm 69 about a thousand years before Jesus was born. And he had no way to know about a coming Roman Empire or the habits of Roman soldiers. He would not have known that Roman soldiers were given Pascha to drink, which is a sour wine that's made with water and wine vinegar. And yet he prophesied that the Messiah would be given sour wine to drink for his thirst. Psalm 69, for my thirst they gave me sour wine to drink. John records in his gospel that Jesus complained of thirst. And all of the gospel writers note that a sponge was soaked in sour wine and was held up for him to drink. A prophecy fulfilled. Two, his bones were not broken in John's gospel account, he notes that the Jews had gone to Pilate and requested that they break the legs of all the criminals on the crosses. And this is because it took a long time for someone to die on a cross, sometimes well more than a day. And it happened to be the day of preparation, which meant that the following day was the Sabbath and they would not be permitted to do the work of burying a body on the Sabbath and yet there was another Jewish law that said if you left a man hanging dead on a tree overnight, it would bring a curse upon the land. And so the soldiers came to break their legs, but when they got to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. And so they left him intact. And John points out that this fulfilled another prophecy of David in Psalm 34. He keeps all of his bones not one of them is broken. But even more than fulfilling that prophecy, there's another reason this is important. Because see, there's another Jewish law, a very strict requirement having to do with the Passover lamb. Numbers 9, 12 says, they shall leave none of it, the Passover lamb, until the morning, nor break any of its bones. 
according to all the statute for the Passover, they shall keep it. And this matters because the Apostle Paul refers to Jesus as our Passover lamb in 1 Corinthians 5. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Like that blood of the Passover lamb that was spread on the doorposts of Jewish people that night in Egypt as the angel of death passed by. The blood of Jesus marks us in the same way as his people. Because of his blood, the judgment of God passes over us. The Passover lamb, his bones were not broken. Number three, his side was pierced. Roughly 500 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Zechariah foretold that the coming Messiah would be looked upon by those who pierced him. And the apostle John again noted that this was a prophecy fulfilled on that night on the cross. You know, sometimes... When people are learning to fence the table for communion, they make a mistake, right? Uh, They say, Jesus broke the bread, and then they say, this is my body broken for you. But no, the bread is broken, not his body. What Jesus actually said is, this is my body given for you. The reality is, Jesus gave up his life for us. He was not put to death against his will. He died at precisely the right moment and on his own terms. But why then did they pierce Jesus if he was already dead? Well, that's just the thing. Because normally it takes so long to crucify a man, they were surprised to see that he was already dead and wanted to make sure. Indeed, when Joseph of Arimathea had asked Pilate for Jesus' body, Pilate was surprised and insisted on verifying with the centurion that it was true. His side was pierced. Finally, the veil was torn. The most telling bit of evidence that Jesus is the Messiah is that the curtain in the temple was torn at the moment of his death. And Scripture tells us that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom like a piece of paper being ripped. And now this is significant for a couple of reasons. Because first it shows us that this was clearly a miraculous event, not a result of the earthquake or some other circumstance. This was a true sign from God. See, when we think of veils, we think of brides, right? We think of a a little bit of wisp of fabric in front of her face, something we could easily tear. Or maybe when we think of a curtain, we think of what's hanging on our living room windows, and we think, you know, I could probably tear that. Or maybe if we're thinking of a thick curtain, we might think of a velvet curtain like we would see in a theater. Maybe it would be hard to get it going, but we could probably rip that as well. But the veil in the temple was much, much more substantial than this. I found a description of it in the Mishnah, which is an ancient Jewish writing. This is the description. The curtain has the thickness of a hand breadth, and it is woven from 72 strands of yarn, and each and every strand from those 72 is made from 24 threads. The curtain was made from four materials, sky blue wool, purple wool, scarlet wool, and fine linen, and a strand was made up of six threads of each type of material. And with regard to the dimension of the curtain, its length was 40 cubits, that's 60 feet, as the height of the ceiling of the sanctuary, and its width was 20 cubits, which is 30 feet, to match the width of the entrance. And it was made from 80 to 10,000, or 820,000, golden dinar and they used to make two new curtains every year and the curtain was so heavy that they needed 300 priests to carry it when they would immerse it now there is some debate uh, about how much the writers of the Mishnah might have been exaggerating 
Some think that it was only four inches thick and it would only have taken a dozen priests to wash it. But everyone's in agreement that it was pretty massive. Nearly a fabric wall. And it would have been highly unlikely, if not impossible, for it to have been torn in two down the middle by anything short of an act of God. And indeed, I suspect that God himself tore the curtain as a sign for us. What kind of sign? Well, that's the second reason. It's significant because of its purpose. See, what the curtain's job was, was to separate a part of the temple where the Shekinah glory of God dwelled. And this area was called the Holy of Holies. And it was separate from the rest of the sanctuary. Now, only priests were allowed to enter the sanctuary, but only the high priest was ever allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. And he was only allowed to enter the Holy of Holies on one day a year, the most holy day, Yom Kippur. And it was said if anyone entered the Holy of Holies, they would die in the presence of the most holy God. The purpose of the curtain, which was adorned, by the way, with embroidered images of cherubim, it was to protect people from stumbling into the very presence of the most holy God. Like the angel uh, with the flaming sword that protected Adam and Eve from returning to the Garden of Eden, this curtain spared sinful man from a certain death. But beyond that practical protection, the veil was a symbol of our separation from God. It reminded God's people that they needed a priest to act as a mediator between them and their God. And when Jesus died for our sins, he became our high priest. And when he called us to follow him, he instituted a priesthood of all believers because his spirit now dwells within us. We now have access to God. The tearing of the curtain was a sign of judgment on the temple. See, Jesus had already declared the temple as forsaken, but this was God's final declaration that the temple with its ritual sacrifices was no longer necessary. It was no longer a part of worshiping him. And the tearing of the curtain was a sign that we have access to the Father in Christ. The Apostle Paul refers to the church as the temple. Not this building, but all of us together as the people. Ephesians 2 says... For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit, a holy of holies. In the old temple, the Gentiles were separated from the Jews, and the women were separated from the men, and the priests were separated from everyone else. But now that all have access to the Father directly in Christ, we have a new unity that we see in Galatians 3. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ, we can step boldly into the presence of Almighty God. For in Christ, we are all adopted as sons and daughters of the King. And indeed, God now indwells us. He indwells us, not a physical structure, but the church that is made up of people. Finally, the tearing of the curtain was a sign that Christ's sacrifice, the offering of himself on our behalf, has been accepted once and for all. The author of Hebrews says this, Hebrews 9, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, 
now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. And nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear for a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Thus, when the Apostle John noted that Jesus' final dying words were, it is finished, we can know that Jesus was right. In that moment, every barrier to the completion of his work, his death and his resurrection had been removed. The prophecies were fulfilled and his perfect, sinless life meant his resurrection was assured. But let's spend just a moment on a couple of things that did not happen that day. Sometimes we uh, recite the Apostles' Creed and when we do so, we say this, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, he was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended into hell. So this brings up a legitimate question. Do we believe that after Jesus died, that he went to hell? Another way of asking this question would be, was Jesus' crucifixion and death insufficient to atone for our sins? so that Jesus also had to suffer the torment of hell. Now, these are just my thoughts about this. I would say I don't think that Jesus lied to the thief on the cross that day when he promised him that they would be together in paradise that very same day as the crucifixion. I would also say that Jesus, uh, or when Scripture speaks of the propitiation for our sins, it only ever refers to the shedding of blood on the cross. And finally, that declaration, it is finished. It sure seems to imply that his work is done with his death on the cross. Some older thoughts about this question, we could find one in our beloved confession. The Westminster Larger Catechism, question number 50, asks, Wherein consisted Christ's humiliation after his death? And the answer is, Christ's humiliation after his death consisted in his being buried and continuing in the state of the dead and under the power of death till the third day, which had been otherwise expressed in these words, he descended into hell. And the Heidelberg Confession accounts for it on Lord's Day 16, question 44, why is there added he descended into hell? And the answer, in my greatest sorrows and temptations, I may be assured and comforted that my Lord Jesus Christ, by his unspeakable anguish, pain, terror, and agony, which he endured throughout all his sufferings, but especially on the cross, has delivered me from the anguish and torment of hell. In short, the historic position is that Jesus did not actually descend into hell, but that his suffering was hellish, and it spares us the effects of an actual hell. Another thing that did not happen that day was that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. That, this last big question, Jesus' cry at the end of the period of darkness, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, I asked a group of people this week what they thought about this statement. And listening to them try to be gracious to Jesus warmed my heart. It was a moment when he was most human. It was a natural reaction to what he had just endured. And yet as we discussed it, it was plain that we all kind of had a problem with it. And I confess that I had always been troubled by this statement because it seems like what I would have said if I had been in that situation. Because it kind of sounds like Jesus was complaining. 
Because it sounds like Jesus had lost faith in God. Because it sounds like Jesus maybe wasn't fully committed to the plan. And I fear that if one day I am martyred, I too will question where God is. How could you let this happen to me? This statement bothers me because I know that if I had uttered it, it would have been sinful. But now I want to show you something. So if you have them, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Hear the word of the Lord. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by all the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me and they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth and from my mother's womb. You have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all of my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but he has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. And all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust. Even the one who could not. Keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. That he has done it. Church, Jesus did not falter in his trust of the Father. He was not complaining. He was not confused. He was not overcome, and no, the Father did not forsake him. He did not hide his face from Jesus. Jesus used nearly his last bit of strength to quote a prophetic psalm, a nearly perfect description of the crucifixion penned a thousand years earlier. And this was a familiar passage, something that all the Jews of the day would have memorized as children. It was a bold declaration that he is 
the Messiah. It was an appeal to believe that he was who he said he was. And so we see that the darkness does not prevail. I hope what you've heard here today gives you all the more confidence that Jesus is our Messiah, our Savior, that he's our prophet, our priest, and our king, and he desires for us to follow him as he builds his kingdom. And so are you still living as if you were in the darkness, or are you walking as children of light? Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together, proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.